Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all in here, and also those of you who are watching online, we welcome you into the services of Harbor Lake Baptist Church, and uh, we're here today to worship, and we're here today to uh, glorify the name of our Savior, Jesus. Now, we have a special service today. We were in VBS all last week. And uh, I really think it was one of the best VBS programs that we've ever had. And uh, the kids responded during the invitation time, and we'll tell you more about that in the weeks ahead. But uh, I think there were how many teens? About 11 when it all shook out? About 11 kids that uh, received Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so we'll be, uh, yeah, go ahead, get after it if y'all want to. I saw some... Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When they're young like that, uh, that's when we grab them, right? Now we've got to grow them up. We've got to help them grow up. We've got to help mom and dad to help them grow up in the Lord. And so we're going to start that process as well. But they did, um, on Friday night, we had an ice cream social, and uh, all of the children came out. Uh, we don't have all of them this morning, but we have some. We've got a good number there. Um, and I wanted you to see what they did, their program, and, and what they learned. Even though we're short about uh, 15, 20 kids or more, but I still want you to know what the theme was and what we went through. And so I've asked Tina to have this program in lieu of all of our praise and worship singing this morning, give you an, a, an opportunity to see what was going on here uh, this last week. I had uh, the opportunity, and I mean it was a great opportunity for me to teach the Bible to every age group as they rotated around to me. And uh, one of the most uh, productive times I've ever had in my ministry, uh, you know, it just the, these kids are so impressionable, I just wish that they were adults. I've told everyone through the years, I was never called to uh, minister to children or youth. But you know what? I'm not old enough to where I can't do it now. Ain't that right, Yahira? So uh, she's looking at my head and my hair, and she's saying, that's right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, uh, that's one of the most rewarding areas of ministry. I got to guess, I got to believe uh, in, in uh, all of the ministries that you could be called to. So without further ado, let me pray. I'm going to have our invocation of sorts, and then... Uh, Tina is going to begin leading us and these children, and um, and then later on, Tina is going to uh, ask you to participate in an offering that these children uh, participated in all week long, and wait till you hear uh, the good news about that offering. Uh, and so we'll do that, and and uh, then after that, Tina is going to sing a song, give you a chance to give your tithes and offerings, and if we have time, then I'll preach, and if we don't have time. I'll preach anyway. So, no, I'm kidding. We'll look at our time. All right, let me pray. Everybody bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for children. 
We know how much children, Lord, means to you. And this morning, we invite you into this service with us, Lord. And I know, Lord, that you're going to be here with us watching these children as we have watched all of them this past week. And you have been a blessing to them, a blessing to us. And Father, we pray this morning that what we do will be a blessing to you, especially through these children. So be with us now, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Tina? The western desert hot and dry The western desert hot and dry Barren land the cloud the sky Barren land the cloud the sky But Jesus makes the desert bloom We discovered the jaw-dropping beauty of the Great Barrier Reef and the arid temperature of the outback afternoons, the architectural marvels of Australia's modern cities, and the fascinating eucalyptus forest, home of the koalas. At Zoomerang, our kids marveled at the unforgettable wildlife culture and be the beauty of the Australian outback while exploring the wonder and value of life, from the lives of pre-born babies to eternity eternal life in the kingdom of God. On Sunday, we explored the Genesis account that describes the creation of man and woman. We found out that people didn't evolve from eight men. Instead, we discovered that Jesus is the author of life. The creator created you special.
life in the streets. But God had a purpose. God had a plan. He gave his image to a woman and a man. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Our God created the earth. The world was filled, but not complete. checked out the words of King David who expressed the wonder of being formed by God even before he was born. We looked at the special design features of our bodies and we learned that we're fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image with a body full of awe-inspiring design features. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh, yeah. You know, we ain't just talking about another branch on the family tree. We're talking about a different tree. Uh, we're talking about trees. Thought we're talking about animals. Uh, animal trees. Just sing the song, mate. Bit faster this time. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made Different than a wombat What a great God, I'm so wonderfully made Different than a dingo, oh, yeah We're made 
way different. For example, have you ever heard a camel try and sing? No, but birds can sing. Fair point. Very repetitive lyrics, though. <laughs> Let's try it faster. Bears are kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Wine fox, there's a crop, clown fish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made. Jesus' birth. Every baby is special, but Jesus was the most special baby ever. Not everyone was excited about his birth, though. When he realized that Jesus was a special king, King Herod wanted to kill Jesus. He wanted to be the only special person around. God values all people, but sometimes people like King Herod don't treat others well. Herod didn't have the right view of life, but God considers all every life valuable no matter how old young smart or physically fit someone is every life is precious to god i am his masterpiece from the top of my head to the tip of my feet i am his masterpiece i matter to god and he matters to me see the setting sun
see the setting sun on a golden beach. It's God's handiwork right there for all to see. But as lovely as this beautiful world can be, we are the masterpiece of all created things. I am this masterpiece from the top of my head to the tip of my feet. Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve didn't obey God, though. They sinned. The punishment for sin is death. Because we're part of Adam and Eve's family, we all sin. Because we sin, we cannot go to be with God in heaven when we die. But because God loves us so much, he wants us to be with him someday. He provided a way to rescue us from our sins, and that's Jesus. God sent his son, Jesus, to the earth as a baby boy, Jesus lived a perfect life as a man. And then he made the greatest sacrifice ever by giving up his life to die on a cross in the place of sinners. He was buried and sealed in a tomb. But because he's God, he didn't stay dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Now Jesus offers every person the gift of eternal life in heaven.
John 11, 25 through 27. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, it shall he live. Shall he live? to him yes lord i believe that you are the christ the son of god who is coming into the world yes lord i believe that you are the christ the son of god who is coming into the world Jesus ascended into heaven, he left his followers with an important mission. We took a closer look at the truth that we are created for a reason. Every believer is part of God's team, working together to do amazing things for God's glory. Just like all parts of your body are needed and important, each with a different job to do, every single member of the body of Christ the people who are part of God's family, has been created for a special purpose and plan. My cup is filled, I overflow. Your loving goodness with me everywhere I go. I'm Jesus' hands and Jesus' feet. Sharing Jesus' love with everyone I meet Everything I say, everything I do I'm living, living, living each day for you oh, Everything I say, everything I do I'm living, living, living each day for you oh. I once was blind, but now I see I'm telling everybody what you've done for me. The grace of God is all around. You came into my life and turned it upside down. Everything I say, everything I do, I'm living, living, living each day for you. Oh, everything I say, everything I do, I'm living, living. Tell on everybody what you done for me, what you done for me, what you done for me. I share his love with everyone I meet, everyone I meet, everyone I meet. I beat Jesus' hands and Jesus' feet. I once was blind, but now I see. The grace of God is all around. Could you get into my life and turn it upside down? Everything I say.
mission emphasis this year at Zoomerang provided a unique opportunity for the children to participate and give into ministries that share the gospel. This year, we partnered with Children's Hunger Fund to provide food for the, the, and hope of the gospel to hungry children in the U.S. and all across the globe. The kids explored five different countries, discovering that everyone is valuable to God. They also learned about children living in poverty around the world and ways to make a difference. The students explored Rwanda, Haiti, Albania, Myanmar, and the United States. They heard the stories of boys and girls whose lives have been touched by poverty. These children have no guarantee of meals, shelter, or an education. They need help, and they need the hope that only comes from the salvation in Jesus Christ. The good news is that you and the kids have the power to make a difference. The Bible says in Proverbs 19:17 that giving generously to the poor is really giving generously to God himself. So far this week, we've collected enough money to provide 2,532 meals. It only takes one quarter to feed one child. So every dollar feeds four kids. Um, I know that you've given so much already this week, kids. Now we're giving you guys a chance to, um, to give. As this video plays, that Ira has made that shows some highlights from this week. You guys will have a chance um, as the plates are passed um, to, to give and help share the gospel with these kids as they are receiving these meals. And I'm going to pray for the offering right before we take it up. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day and for this opportunity that we have to partner with you and with the Children's Hunger Fund to feed hungry children across this world and more importantly, to share the gospel of Jesus. Please bless this offering that we're about to receive and use it for your work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The western desert hot and dry. The western desert hot and dry. Barren land, the cloud, the sky. This crazy world is gonna stray. Jesus is the only way. 
to go any further. I just want, if you helped in any way, whether you were part of the fellowship committee that helped with the food, security, pictures, tour guides, teachers, if you'd stand up so that everyone can see um, who you are, and let's give you a big round of applause for the awesome job that you did this week, um, sh helping share the gospel with these kids. Thank you for all that you have done. Good morning, church member. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good day at the house of the Lord. And thank you for everything, Tina, for everything you've done. Let us pray. Our oh, Father in heaven, we are grateful that you are our strength, our song, and our heart with joy. We offer our gift to you with joy and gladness. We have what well, all we have belongs to you, and we are glad to share some of your many gifts with you. Bless the gift and, and the giver, and use it for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. the sun where to stand in the morning and who told the ocean you can only come this far and who show the moon where to hide to evening whose words alone can Catch a falling star. Well, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. All of creation testifies. Let this light. Within me cry, I know my Redeemer lives. Oh, yeah, the very same guy that's been saying in no death runs to the weary, the war. And the same gentle hands that hold me when I'm broken, they he conquered death to bring me victory. I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer. Testify, let this life with 
Amen is right. I'll tell you what, if the doctor makes a mistake and I'm not really dead when they roll me in here, that'll raise me up. Amen. Uh, thank you, kids. They did a great job this whole week. I wish you all could have been here uh, at least one night during the week. I think we had about 35 average, maybe a little less than that all week long. Uh, but they were just, um, uh, they were loud. So <laughs> I wish you could have been here to hear them. Uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, the second part of a message called um, Authentic Worship. We talked about that. We started last week looking at uh, real, authentic worship from Mark chapter 7, the first 23 uh, verses. And uh, Jesus' encounter with the, <clears throat> with the Pharisees and how it results in him exposing disingenuous uh, worship uh, that they were offering to God. So before we uh, get into this any further, would you bow your head and let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus and the cross and the blood. And, uh, and Lord, today, just open our hearts and minds to hear what you have for us to hear. And uh, Lord, sometimes it's hard to hear your word. I know that. We all know that. But nonetheless, Lord, everything that you command us to do, everything you tell us is best for us, we know, Lord, is, it's better that we uh, obey you and, and avoid any things that the devil might throw at us, Lord. We need to obey you, even though sometimes we, we hear something that's hard to, to hear. So help us, Lord, this morning as we look at this and how Jesus deals with the Pharisees and, Lord, how you are dealing with us in our lives today as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this encounter in, in uh, Mark 7 really should make us all, every one of us, take a close look at what we call and how we define authentic worship. As I mentioned last week, when we started in chapter 7, I, I believe this is the most important subject for all of us, this subject of genuine, authentic worship. What is it? How do we offer it? When do we offer it? And so this week, I was telling you earlier, I, I taught the Bible class to our children in VBS each night, and I thought of these questions that I had asked you last week and what I had been working on for this week. And I prayed all week for God to help me to convey to those children the importance of worship every day in every situation. And, uh, and not just communicate that worship was only once a week on Sunday. But worship is in the way we help others, the way we talk to others, love others every day, even those who don't love us. That is uh, worship and every Christian life should be one continuous uninterrupted flow of worship now if that becomes our way of life I think it'll serve to keep us on the narrow path that leads to heaven as well that's the bonus of it right because listen the way you worship will determine the way you walk and the opposite of course is always true the way you walk will always define your worship and uh, more and more, I'm understanding that worship involves the great commandment. In fact, I go so far to say is the very essence and definition of worship is the great commandment. Uh, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then we add this verse and can, we can see how seamlessly what we call worship blends into daily worship. Colossians 3 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Someone wrote these words. These Christians, they're praising God on Sunday, but they'll be all right on Monday because it's just a harmless little habit they've acquired. And you know why people say that? Because people don't really expect us to be any different on Monday morning because we were here on Sunday. And, uh, but this thing of worship, uh, it doesn't stop when we leave the church. As I said last Sunday, and I want to continue to say this Sunday, 
Uh, we don't come to church to worship. We're, uh, we're to bring our worship with us when we come into the church. And also, we don't stop worship when we leave church. We take our worship with us when we go. And so I challenge all of us to examine all facets of our worship habits. Now, last week we looked at the Pharisees and, and discovered they were worshiping the right God, but in the wrong way. And we discovered this, worshiping the wrong God is wrong every time without fail. That's true, every time. Uh, but we also learned that equally as wrong is worshiping the right God in the wrong way. That's what these Pharisees were doing. And Jesus lowered the boom on them. In, in verse 6, he said, uh, he answered and said to them, rightly, uh, correctly did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it's written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Worship is loving God with all your heart, everywhere, at all times, in front of everyone unashamedly. So when you go to your job tomorrow morning, God expects you to be as passionate in your worship and your devotion to Him as you are this very moment. And yet what we often do is we try to contain worship to Sunday, just Sunday. Um, we talked about uh, every week on our social media there, we, I, I talked to you about how you'll read someone saying, well, on a Sunday, I got my worship on today. I got my worship on today. Uh, every Sunday afternoon, you see that posted all over social media. I got my worship on today. Uh, it's bad theology, though. That's what I told you last week. It's bad theology. I'm getting my worship on today. Because, listen, we are to never take our worship off. That's what it means to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. You're loving Him at all times, everywhere, in front of everyone, with everything that you have. It's how you deal with customers. It's how you respond to your boss. It's how you disciple your own children. It's how you greet strangers. It's how you treat your wife. It's how you treat your husband. It's how strong the fragrance of Christ is in your home. That's worship. That's what Jesus is trying to teach these Pharisees. And yet, we have restricted it down to an hour and a half once a week. Now, last week I told you there were three characteristics of unauthentic worship, fake worship, vain worship that Jesus addresses in these verses. And those three are, worship is in vain when selfish tradition is more important than scriptural truth. And we wore that out last week. Today we'll talk about these two. Worship is vain when human reasoning replaces holy responsibility. Worship is in vain, number three, when, look, when looking righteous is more important to you than living righteously. So, again, we work through point one. We're going to start here with point two. And that is, worship is in vain when human reasoning replaces holy responsibility. In other words, when excuses replace obedience, we worship in vain. Look at verses 9 through 13. It says, He said to them, All too well, you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And he who, who, he, he who curses father or mother, mother let him uh, be put to death. But you say, stop right there. You know, Jesus did that a lot. Uh, as I was studying through this, I thought about how um, uh, he said this over and over. You've heard it said, but I say. You heard that? You read that, that Jesus said that all over the Bible, all over the New Testament, right? Everybody with me? He says, you've heard it said, but now I say. But, but in this passage right here, he turns that completely around. He says this, you've heard what the Word of God says, but you say. But you say. He's pitting those words against one another to make his point. You know what God's Word says, but this is what you say. That's what Jesus is telling them. But then he goes on, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is uh, Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect uh, through your tradition, which you have handed down. And many of these things do you do, Jesus said. He's just pointing out one here. Now, what he's doing, though, 
as he points it out, he's like a, a preacher that preaches, well, like I try to do. I try to have an illustration for you so that you will see it in, in a working fashion in front of you. Well, he does that. He gives an illustration. He says, you, you guys do a mass amount of such crazy things that make you hypocrites, but let me just give you one illustration of what I'm talking about. He says, you guys have created this loophole called Corbin. Now, for us Gentiles, you and me, uh, we don't exactly know what that is. And so Mark defines it for us. And you've got to remember, who is Mark writing to? A bunch of Gentile Christians who are being persecuted. They would have no idea what Corbin is. So um, it's this. And I'm glad they defined it for us because we'd have theological books written about what that meant, right? No, it just says, it just means it's a gift to God. So we understand what Corbin is. Now the law, the law, the commandment is to honor your father and mother. That's simple enough, isn't it? That's straightforward enough, isn't it? Love them, honor them, bless them, respect them, then take care of them when they're older to the best of your ability. That's pretty straightforward. And the reason for this is because Social Security and retirement had different names in those days. Uh, they had them back then, Social Security and retirement, but it was called, you know what it was called? It was called kids, children. They'd have a lot of kids because that was their retirement. It was their 401K and Social Security. So they would have babies and lots of them. And when they got older, un unable to take care of themselves, they were, they were able to bank on the kids. They're going to take care of us. But here's the loophole the Pharisees created. The Jews came up with this legal, religious loophole that allowed them to keep their money away from their parents without feeling guilty about it. They called it Corbin. So they could say, I'm going to declare everything I have, all my money, all my possessions, all my land, all my homes, everything I have, I'm going to declare it Corbin. It's a gift to God. I'm dedicating everything. I'm giving everything I have to God. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds right, doesn't it? Sounds like, wow, what an awesome guy. And what they would do, though, is they would go to the priest and they'd declare everything that he has to be Corbin. All of it's going to be God's. And then they would give a little down payment to the priest. Do you get it? And uh, that seals the deal uh, with, uh, with the uh, synagogue, with the, with the temple and with the, seat, with the uh, priest. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. It didn't go to God until that person was dead. You get it? Is it coming together for you? They were free to use their money and their possessions on themselves until they died. So mom and dad would come and say, we're too old. Guys, look at us. We're too sickly. We can't work. It's time for you to take care of us. And the son would say, mom and dad, why, I would love to help you. I really would. But I've declared everything Corbin, Corbin. And what I would eagerly have given to you, mom and dad, I've already given it to God and I can't take it back. Oh, that sounds devout, doesn't it? That sounds great, doesn't it? But Jesus says, Jesus said about it, you have made a man-made excuse to allow you to put everything else aside regarding obeying the Word of God. Now, some of you are already out there thinking with me this morning, if I explain that to you well enough, you're probably thinking with me, wow, that's downright evil. Anybody got that going on? That's downright evil of them. Yes, it is. But whoa, trigger. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Guess what? Guess what? Your excuses for not obeying the word of God, you know what they are? They too are evil. Just like these. They too are evil. You see, Jesus is exposing their heart. He's saying, you're doing all of this on the outside, and it looks good, it sounds good, but it exposes that you have a heart problem. You've got a heart of betrayal. You've got a dirty heart. You have a defiled heart, and yet you think everything is okay. Uh, you think bad behavior makes for a bad person, and good behavior makes for a good person. Jesus says, that's not true. That's not the case at all. So what excuses do we today, what excuses do we use to not obey God's word or not have to obey God's word? And that excuse sometimes we justify it. What, what excuses do we use? Can you think of anything in your life, that any excuse that you use uh, that makes it where you don't have to obey the Word of God? 
Anybody think of anything? Let me help you. The scripture says we're to share the gospel, right? Every Christian who loves Christ and has received grace and mercy, every Christian who's filled with the Holy Spirit, it's their joy, it's their responsibility to share the good news of the gospel with people who need it, right? Am I right? Is there no one who would say an amen? I wish Billy Rife would hear. We're here. He'd say amen. Well, I'm telling you the truth. It's our responsibility to share the gospel. And, and that doesn't just apply to the church and missionaries that we give to and the cooperative program that we give to. No, no, no. It, it applies to individuals. Individuals. Um, not just for the church. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you argue with me over that, you've got deeper issues that we can't solve today. But hopefully you'll agree. Hopefully you'll agree. But you know what? We, we say, well, you know, preacher, sharing the gospel, man, that sharing my testimony in front of somebody, uh, that's just not who I am. That's just not who I am. And I work in a place where they frown on that, and I don't want to push a person further away. And I've only been a Christian for 32 years. I just don't know if I'm quite ready to do that. Can you believe that? That's a joke. Y'all ought to laugh at that one. Although I have had people who've been Christians that long tell me that sharing the gospel is just not for them. But you know what that's called? Here's what I'm getting at. It's called excuses. Excuses. Now, sometimes the word of God is hard to hear. I understand that. This may be one of those moments for the Christian, the body of Christ. This may be something that's hard to hear. But it's excuses, and it exposes your heart. And do you know what's in your heart? Evil. It's evil, just like we said of the Pharisees when they declared uh, Corbin. Well, it's evil when we decide that we're not going to obey the God, uh, obey God with the sharing of the good news, the gospel. It's not some whimsical kind of thing, you know, where God says, "Oh, I understand," and and that's the way it goes, and, and don't you worry about it. I promise you, uh, it's not that way. God's not saying, you know, I know you're not very good at that, so. Just let it go and find something else you can do. That's not what he's saying. Finding something else you can do is the gift that you may have. But listen, you don't need the gift of, of uh, uh, sharing the good news. You don't need that. Everybody is to do that. In that sense, you can say that we all have the gift of evangelism. Now he's saying that's an excuse, that's an evil in your heart. Now here's another one. The Bible tells us as believers to pray for, pray with other believers, doesn't it? See that all through the New Testament. Man, when they prayed, sometimes the, the buildings shook. Jail cells opened up. I mean, when the, when the early church prayed, power came on them. And you see it all through the New Testament. They were praying with one another, people all the time, every time. And, uh, and they were praying for one another as they got together. But, so the question is, who are you praying with in these days? Do you have a prayer partner? Do you? I know some of you do because you tell me about it. And, uh, but you need a prayer partner. And who are you praying for? Do you have someone? Do you have a lost loved one? Do you have someone who's sick? Do you have someone who needs the Lord that you're praying for consistently on a regular daily basis? And some people talk about when we come together to pray even on a Wednesday night to pray. You know, I just can't do that. I can't pray in, a, in front of other people. Why, that would be too embarrassing. Don't you know, preacher, that's a private thing between me and God? Uh, and that's not just the way I'm wired, preacher. Well, you know what that is? That's evil being exposed in your heart. Again, some of these things are hard to hear, aren't they? But just remember this. Always remember this. This message got to me before it got to you, okay? All right? God's speaking to me as well. But we're using an excuse to be disobedient. That's all that is. One, one more. The Bible says... Forgive as you've been forgiven, freely, completely, wholeheartedly, joyously, gracefully. Forgive others as you have been forgiven. And yet, we have bitter Christians with uh, depressed hearts, and they're holding on to the past, and they're saying, you don't know what that person did to me. If I told you, you'd see that it's justified, that I'm just not going to forgive them. You don't know, preacher. You just don't know what it was. You know what that exposes in your heart? Evil, right? That's the third time I've said that. Y'all ought to get that word the next time I ask it, right? What is it? Evil. Evil. It's an excuse to be disobedient to the Word of God. Well, preacher, you really don't know. If you'd have known this, if you'd have had to go through this, 
you'd understand why I'm so bitter. Um, well, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to understand it. Can I just tell you folks that are holding on things like that, bad things have happened to all of us. Bad things happen. You're not special. You're not unique in that way. We all get our shot at it, all of us, at death, relational uh, problems, uh, work problems, financial problems, bad breath, you name it. We all get our shot at doing it God's way or our way. And we can use excuses, but all it does is reveal the evil in your heart. Now, I could go on and on, on on some examples, but I won't. You're welcome, by the way. But you've got excuses, do you not? If we admit it today, we've got excuses. Oh, preacher, we just live together uh, out, of, out of wedlock because uh, in this world today, why, you just can't make it out there on one salary. Uh, you can't pay the bills. Well, then why don't you get married like God said you should before you begin living together? Guys, listen to me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say this. this. This shacking up thing that is so accepted today, that, that's an affront to God. That's like shaking your fist uh, in, the in God at the institution of marriage when you just shack up together. You watch any program on TV, it's the new being married. It's the new marriage, you know, shacking up together. It's the new marriage. I mean, you know, you see them on there and, and shows in the past, you'd say, a guy's sweet on the girl, and the girl's sweet on the guy, and he would uh, ask her to marry him first. And, uh, but they wouldn't shack up at that moment. They'd get married before they began to live together. But nowadays, the new marriage on TV from Hollywood is shacking up. You know, they'll come to each other and they'll have a big kiss and they'll say, I believe we should move in together. Not, I believe we should get married. Not that at all. So that's, that's the new marriage, shacking up. But guys, listen to me. You've already... You've already used that smooth, snaky, sneaky talk to make one thing out of her, so why don't you do the right thing and now make a wife out of her? Well, we're just not sure if we love each other enough uh, for that just yet. Oh, yeah? Well, when does that come? After the first baby? Third baby? Tenth baby? Girls, ladies, listen. Listen. Have you really thought that through, that one day you may very well wind up a single mom because of that deadbeat guy that you allowed to shack up with? Because that shining Jedi Knight you thought you shacked up with was really Darth Vader on meth. And you discover that all too late. Listen, I've heard them all. I've heard them all. Uh, th but this morning what I'm saying, would you be bold enough and humble enough and, and repentant enough um, to let God show you and expose to you the, the excuses that you've been making when it comes to worshiping Him. And then get on your face and say, God, I didn't want him any, I don't want it anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. That's not me anymore from this point on. I won't make any more excuses, Lord, to disobey you. But here's the great thing. 1 John 1, 9 says, If you confess your sin, your evil, your excuses, whatever it is, if you confess your sin, He will forgive all your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Yeah. Amen, it is. So this morning, this is not a message that I'm trying to say, you are terrible. I'm not saying that. You have, I have, all of us have parts of our heart that we make excuses for, but, but we have a loving and gracious God who sacrificed his son on the cross for us. And then he picked him up and raised him up from the dead. And now all he says is, all you have to do is recognize you're a sinner, recognize that your heart isn't all that it needs to be, expose it to me, I will heal it, forgive it, and you will give it to me and live for me the rest of your life. And God says, if that happens, I'll use you to bring me glory in your life. Now that's the story. And, uh, you know, we want to say, uh, just prove it, Lord. If you're going to be that good to me, just prove it, and, and God will do something miraculous in your life. Well, that's just one thing. Show me something else, Lord. And we go on and on and on like that. When God is showing you day by day how much he loves you. Um, but here's the only proof that we should ever need. It's this, Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
He died for us because we were miserable people. Miserable, depressed, depraved, evil-hearted people. But Jesus loved us enough to die for us in that human state. And uh, we use excuses. I mean, we pull excuses from everywhere. What excuses are you using this morning? What excuses do you have? Let God, let God deal with that. I mean, this is a real good question to, today. What excuses are you using? Well, you know, I got a job, Pastor, and I can't come to church. I mean, I just can't come to church because I've got a job. And, and, and I know that job came from God, and he gave it to me. And so I can't come to church on Sunday morning. So let me get this right. You got a job that came from God, and it keeps you from God's house and God's people and God's worship every single Sunday, but it's from God? Give me a break. Give me a break. Who do you think I am? I mean, who do you think anybody is with that kind of jar? It's an excuse. Will we admit that? It's one of 100,000 that we use. It's an excuse. Very quickly, and I'll be done. Uh, worship is in vain when looking righteous is more important than living righteously. Now, um, in other words, in, uh, what, 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 I'm, what I'm saying there is, uh, Jesus is saying in that passage, you're satisfied at, uh, at looking right with God rather than actually being right with God. And God says, when you're satisfied with looking right and not being right, I don't want your worship. He doesn't accept all worship. You all understand that, right? Well, this is one. The Pharisees had this erroneous thinking that bad, be bad behavior made bad people, good behavior made good people. Um, but Jesus clearly refuted that and says just the opposite. Look at verse 14. It says, when he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand. There's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears, let him hear. Now, how many of you out there have ears? That means anyone who has ears. That's all of us, right? We got ears. So, so Jesus is saying, you got ears, I want you to hear me today. And so he's emphatically saying, everybody listen up, it's important. And he calls a multitude to him to do this, and he's giving them a heads up to listen up. He's talking about defilement and acceptability and unacceptability. He's talking about righteousness. Uh, what makes a person defiled? What makes a person unrighteous and un unacceptable to God? And then on the other hand, what makes a per person acceptable and righteous to God? That's what defiled and undefiled really meant then. It means the same today. And the Pharisees believed that if you did the right things, you could be righteous, you could be accepted. Jesus says an emphatic no, that is not right. Because if behavior was all it took, the law would be good enough. Did you hear me? If behavior was all it took, then the law would be good enough. But the law wasn't good enough because you've got a deeper problem. I've got a deeper problem. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And of course, his disciples, you know, they're kind of like us, right? His disciples are kind of slow. Look at uh, verse 17. And when he later entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him about that parable. And he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding as well? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the person from outside can't defile him because it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and it's eliminated. Thereby, the Lord declared all foods clean. You see, you're not made unacceptable and unrighteous by what's coming into your body because it doesn't enter your heart. It enters your stomach, Jesus said. It's eliminated. It's gone, um, and, and, and uh, we don't have to deal with it. Um, but look at these verses. And he said... What comes out of a man that defiles a man? What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For uh, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come within and defile a man. So we tend to think sometimes that if we can just fix the problem on the outside or fix the behavior on the outside, then everything's going to be okay. If I could fix this person, if I could 
uh, help that person change their habits and if I could help them correct their behavior it, it, or if I could stop cussing or if I could just control my temper or if I could just stop lusting and on and on and on we can go. Then I would be acceptable to God. Then I would really be righteous. No, 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 a thousand times no. It's always the evil inside that hooks you to the evil outside. You do the things you do because of who you are on the inside. And that evil that shows up on the outside was already there on the inside. And no amount of reform just dealing with the outside, the surface of the problem, no amount of reform is going to make you acceptable to God. And listen, the evil inside of you is a magnet that draws you to do evil things on the outside of you. Let me say that again. The evil on the inside of you is a magnet that draws you to do evil things out on the outside of you. You see, my problem is not murder. A murderous heart that allow, it's a murderous heart that allows me to hate people who are created in the image of God. Yeah, my problem uh, is, is not sexual immorality. My problem is wanting something, crave, craving something that God says isn't the best for me. And, and, and isn't his plan for my life, yet I crave it and want it all the more. Stealing stuff is not my problem. Um, it's a ravenously uh, materialistic heart that never seems to be satisfied or content, and uh, I want more for me rather than wanting more of him. I want more of me. So listen, the issue isn't uh, out here, the issue is in here, inside. And if the heart doesn't change, nothing else matters. We're going through the motions, right? But as Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, brethren, I would not leave you without hope. And uh, so, so here's the good hope. Here's the good news of the gospel. The, the, the promise of God is he will give us a new heart. Did you see that? He will give us a new heart. Free of charge. We'll have to do anything for it. He will give it if we ask for it. He will give us a new heart. See, God isn't into taking care of your old heart and patching it up and, and uh, making it look better. No, no. He's into a heart transplant. That's what he wants to do. So, so when you come and you identify, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't do anything. I try and I try and I try, and I'm good for a while, but I got some willpower, but that willpower just runs out. Lord, I need you. When you come to him like that and you say that, I, I believe that Christ died for me. I, I believe he rose from the dead. I believe I'm a sinner beyond hope. Uh, and you, you share that with God. You know what he says? All right, here's a new heart. That's when you get your new heart. Ezekiel chapter 36. Look at this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you uh, your old, old heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. A heart that's alive, that's a heart that responds to God. Now listen, if you don't have a new heart, if you don't have a new heart, a heart that's alive into you, a heart that's been given to you by God, then I want to tell you this morning, beyond any doubt, that the spirit of God is knocking at the door of your stone heart. And that person um, who has a stony heart, uh, you know what that means? That means they've rejected the gospel over and over. That means they've rejected the Lord Jesus. That means I'm going to live the way I want to leave, live and I'll pull Jesus out of that little box when I need him and I need to talk to him about, uh, or I need to talk to others about him to make me look better. But well, listen, I want to tell you, that doesn't go together. Um, a person who has a stone heart like that from all that repetition of rejecting the Lord that person no longer has ears to hear. The Spirit works on a heart of flesh, pliable, malleable, can be worked. Those two do go together, right? Can I just ex admit to you this morning, uh, no surprise to you, probably, but I don't have it all together. I really don't. My heart still needs some work. Anybody else with me on that? I mean, I don't have, I need, you know, but you know what that's called? Sanctification. That's a good Bible word, isn't it? 
thought you would know that because it was such a good Bible word, you Bible scholars here. Um, but it's called sanctification. Sanctification. Um, God's still working on us. He's still working. We're saved, but we're not where we're going to be, but thank God we're not where we were, right? He's constantly working on us. Um, and, and listen, this is important too. I'm about done. Do you have a heart that's brand new? Maybe you just got saved. Maybe you're a believer. Somebody in here, maybe somebody watching online. Are you a new believer? Then you have a brand new heart, but maybe God hasn't started working on that heart yet the way he will. And so uh, if you're a Christian and you have that new heart, you need to guard against developing stony places in that heart, hard places in that heart, uh, because the devil will use that. Yes, the devil's real. Uh, I'm so sick of having to explain that to people. I've had three conversations this week when people told me that they didn't believe in the devil. Had one young man, used to be a member of this church, and he said that he's an atheist now. And I said, that's not true. You're not an atheist. Nobody is an atheist, and I can prove it to you if you give me 15 minutes on lunch one day. But I, I just get, people just continue to think they give, they give glory to the devil and, uh, instead of giving glory to God. Uh, but if you got a, a brand new heart, that was given to you at salvation. Uh, that's the first step. And if you're a, a Christian and you have that new heart, have you created any parts where they're hard in that heart um, by using excuses to do what you want to do rather than being obedient? But would you be open enough and bold enough and willing enough to say, God, here's my heart. Um, expose it for what it is, what it really is. Show me what you want me to do, Lord. How can you help me to be all that I can be for you? Because I don't want any worship, any of my worship to be worthless. I don't want my worship to be hypocritical and fake and, uh, and, and worthless. I don't want that, Lord. I don't want it to be wasted. If that's you this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity now to come and uh, down to the front. Ms. Dulce, do you think you might wake your way to this piano? And uh, I want you to have a chance to respond. I've told you all before, I don't think there's ever a place for preaching the gospel without the opportunity to respond to it. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried the third day. Buried on the third day, he arose again. And that was God putting his stamp of approval on what Jesus did on the cross. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there could be no removal of sins. And the sacrifice for our sins, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the sacrifice for our sins had to be a perfect sacrifice. That's the picture Jesus painted all through the Old Testament, wasn't it? Those lambs they had to examine and they had to make sure there were no spots on it, that they were perfect on the outside at least. They were perfect. Well, that's the same way we come to the Lord. He was perfect. He did not sin. He wasn't even born the same way that you and I were born. Um, and so he had no sin. Only one qualified in all of history to die for the sins of the world. The only one. And he willingly went to the cross for you. I tell you, it's hard for me to get over that every time I recite those words. It's hard for me to get over the fact that someone loved me uh, that much. There weren't many people in my life that I knew loved me um, completely. Um, and Jesus doing that blows me away. He does that for you and for me. And so if you're a Christian, and maybe you've, allowed some of these things in, in your heart, these evil things that allow you to disobey God or cause you to disobey God, you ask forgiveness. God will forgive that. He'll give you a new, fresh start on that heart. He'll make, he'll make that stony part of your heart flesh again. But if you're not saved, you need to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ right now, this day, uh, this moment. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So I'm going to ask you, if you will, to do that. And Miss Dulcie's going to play number 315 if you want to use a hymnal. Uh, or the lyrics will be up on the screen. But I'm going to give you a few minutes to come to this altar. Or I'll be glad to pray with you about anything. 
But you can come to this altar and speak to the Lord yourself about whatever he's spoken to you about this morning. So um, you come while we sing. Number 315, there's room at the cross for you while we stand, while we sing, and while you come. Is a shelter in which we can hide. Grace so free is sufficient for me. Deep is its fountain, wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. Room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Let's sing verse 2. Though millions have found him a friend, and have turned from the sins they have sinned. The Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross for There's room at the cross for you. No millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Well, amen. You'll be seated for just a moment. Brother Jim's got some announcements. And uh, Jim. We're, um, hang on. Uh, for today, uh, tonight there's no evening service, so if you would, uh, just pray and, and seek the Lord at home. Uh, please pray for the 12 children who made a profession of faith this week in VBS. <laughs> 